Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video we're going to react to the most gangster tanker of World War II. I love these military type videos and it seems like the fat electrician has pretty much nailed down this niche. He is a really good storyteller like he you know he adds a sort of um how can I describe it? A sort of punchy, no nonsense, but yet comedic style. It's really good. And World War II stories, they're just so interesting. It feels like, I mean, it is a bygone era, but you know, with the world the way it is now, I think there's a lot of parallels and lessons we can take from it. And it's always fun learning about people who were just so extraordinary, who, you know, just went above and beyond. Guy that Brad Pitt's character in the movie Fury is based off of, uh, and yes, the nickname War Daddy was real. I've Today we're talking Fury. about the most gangster tank. Com Great movie Fury. I've actually reacted to it. I'll link it. Commander in American history, Lafayette Greenpool, his incredible crew, and their infamous M4A176 W Sherman tank, known by its moniker painted across the side in the mood. This video is brought to you by War mood. Thunder, the best and most realistic vehicle combat video game that has ever been made. Once upon a time, July 23rd, 1919, two twins would be born, John Thomas Poole and his younger brother by five minutes, Lafayette Green Poole. They both spent their entire childhood growing up in Texas. The Great Depression happened when they were 10 years old. Despite that, they were both star athletes in middle school and high school. And then when they graduated from high school in 1937, John and Lafayette, the two brothers, wanted to join the Navy together. Like everything else they'd done in their life at this point, they go down to the local recruiting office together and they both sign up for the U.S. Navy. Then they go to get their physicals. John passes with flying colors, but Lay, on the other hand, is rejected because his eyesight isn't good enough because oh, he has one bad man. eye from an injury from when he was younger. Which is turning Dang. into a weird pattern at this point because there's a shocking amount of badasses that are originally rejected from the U.S. military for apparently having bad eyesight. I mean, off the top of my head, we've got Lawson Red Ramage, the first submarine commander to earn the Medal of Honor. Which, I don't know why your vision needs to be super good inside of a submarine, but whatever. Then we've got Willis Ching Lee, literally an Olympic sniper that was the greatest battleship commander of all time. I guess you could argue that because, you know, it's, it limits the liability of the military. If anything goes wrong and then person like, like the guy sues the military for letting him in, maybe that's why just covering their bases. That after he had won the Olympics for sharpshooting, was told sharpshooting, was told that his vision wasn't good enough. And then of course we have Jay Zemer, Medal of Honor recipient, the pilot of the most decorated air crew in US history that was also rejected because his vision wasn't good enough. And now we have Lafayette Greenpool, the greatest American tanker of all time, also being rejected because his vision just isn't quite good enough. Now, that being just said, here's where Poole is just wrong. a little bit different from those other heroes. He's trying to join in 1937. World War II has not kicked off yet, so he's not overly motivated to join the military. So, unlike the other three, he does not cheat on his eye exam to get in. He decides that he's just going to go off to college and become an engineer. So that's what happens. John ships off to go get trained for the Navy. Lay decides he's going to stay around town. He helps his parents out on the farm. He goes off to college to become an engineer, and he also decides that he's going to start boxing to earn some extra money on the side. And over the course of the next three years, he never loses a single match because he is an incredibly talented boxer. Then, September 16th, 1940, Impressive. America decides to reinstitute the draft because World War II is looming on America. Because of this, Lay decides that he's going to try to join the military again, but he's concerned that the Navy still has records of him failing his vision test from a couple of years ago. So, instead, this time Fake he goes name? to an army recruiter, gets uh... signed up, goes to the physical, and this time he does what all great American heroes do. He cheats on that eye exam and he passes. Seriously, the impact that a bunch of dudes cheating on the eye exam to get into the military has had on the world that we live in today is profound. So Paul ships off to train. But how do you sh how do you cheat on an eye exam? Unless maybe someone tells you if it's one of those what letter is that? What letter is that? If you could memorize what letter it could be that the person's pointing to. Because how do you cheat on such a test? He excels at everything he does, and then every time he gets leave, he's always going out and taking boxing prize fights to win more money on the side. So he finishes training, gets assigned to the 32nd Armored Regiment, where he rapidly becomes a sergeant and a tank commander, again, continuing to box every second he can. As World War II ramps up, the 32nd Armored Regiment's training gets more and more intense as they get put in different climates in different places all over the country. They train in Louisiana, they train in Pennsylvania, and now they're out in the Mojave Desert in California. 
And at this point, Poole's developed quite a name for himself. Everybody knows who he is. He's a six foot three boxer that's 41 and 0. He's never been defeated. And he is one of the best, Battles. if not the best tank commander that they have. And because of this, he gets a little bit of sway with how things go. So he actually goes out and starts picking his own tank crew. And he picks the best of the best. In the driver's seat, he's got 24 year old private first class Wilbert Richards, AKA Baby. A nickname that he got when the crew was out for dinner one night at a diner. And the waitress looked at him and said, I didn't think they let babies join the army. Despite having- Oh my God. She flamed him. A baby face, Poole said that he was the best tank driver in all of World War II. He was so good that he could parallel park a Sherman tank in the middle of downtown New York during rush hour traffic. In the gunner's seat, we have Willis Ollier, AKA Groundhog, a nickname that he got in the Mojave Desert because he constantly wore his goggles and had dirt rings from the goggles around his eyes at all times. He is the oldest man in the crew at 28 years old. He was a factory worker at an ammunition plant. He was exempt from the draft, but he wanted to go to war anyways, so much so that he had to go to the government to get permission to quit his job so that he could be in that tank. Wow. At loader, we've got 21 year old Delbert Boggs, AKA Jailbird. A nickname that he got because he was allegedly there because the judge gave him the option of go to war or, or go to prison. jail uh, standing at only five foot six 100 easy choice to make 120 pounds jailbird had probably the most physically demanding job in the entire tank crew despite his stature he was able to load that gun faster than pool could say fire and then an assistant driver and bow gunner we have arthur reed who has not quite earned a nickname yet the crew then decided that their fearless leader needed a nickname too. Poole was already becoming a legend. He was an undefeated boxer. He was one of the best tank commanders America had, and he made sure that everybody in his crew was squared away and taken care of at all times. He took complete responsibility for them. He was just like their dad, and for that reason, they gave him one of the coolest nicknames ever, and the same one from the movie Fury, War Daddy. Hey, don't fuck yourself, War Daddy. Got me too high. <laughs> Unlike the movie, however, Paul War Daddy is quite a badass nickname. It could be like a, a like a, a rapper's name as well. It's got that kind of just straight up, don't mess with me kind of, uh, you know, vibe to Paul it. Paul did not decide to name his tank Fury. He gave it a nickname that is a thousand times cooler and Hollywood decided to change for no good reason because they named their tank In The Mood. When asked what that mood. meant later, Lafayette simply said, that's just how I felt at the time. I was <laughs> in the mood. Very so we've got good. the crew, we've got the tank, everybody has a cool nickname. It's time to get ready for war. They start training together super hard and become one <laughs> cohesive unit. At this point, Poole, who's still been going out boxing every chance he can, ends up joining the Golden Gloves tournament and he actually ends up winning and becoming a Golden Gloves champion, which wow. qualifies him for the national tournament in Chicago. At this point, the army is willing to let him take leave and go participate in this national tournament because it looks really, really good for the US military mm. if they have an active duty sergeant that's a tank commander a man, that's uh, winning national boxer. titles for boxing. It makes sense. Poole, however, Great decides PR. against it because he has his crew, he has his tank, and he's not gonna let them go off to war without him. So he decides to forego his dream of becoming a national Golden Glove boxing champion and instead goes off to war. Because of that, he is then offered a slot as an officer, which he also refuses because he doesn't want to leave his crew. He decides that he's going to keep being an NCO so he can be a tank commander and go out with his guys. Shortly after that, they would all ship off to England in 1943. Once they get to England, they just keep training, getting ready, waiting for orders. And then in April 1944, a famous boxer by the name of Joe Lewis, oh, AKA the Brown Bomber, comes over right for a morale mission where he's going to box with some of the troops you know get everybody ready for war get them hyped up doing something cool and guess who gets slotted to fight him yeah war lafayette daddy. pool boxes joe lewis two months before d-day and if you don't know who joe lewis is he's literally one of the greatest boxers in the history of the world this dude is 69 wins with 52 knockouts he has one of the longest reigning title runs ever he is on a different level than Lafayette Greenpool, for sure. Despite that, everybody's hyped. The entire regiment is gonna show up to watch War Daddy go toe to toe with the Brown Bomber, and it's gonna be the coolest thing that's ever happened. So they have this boxing match, and you have to understand, this is a recipe for disaster because Joe Lewis is just over here trying to do the right thing, help mm. with the war effort, raise morale of the troops before- Yeah, Joe doesn't really wanna like hurt Lafayette, you know, but at the same time, he's not gonna wanna be humiliated either. So you gotta strike that balance, like. They go off into battle. You know, he's being really cool about this whole thing. He's going from unit to unit and he's boxing a new army guy every night for like 
months straight. So, I mean, this wow. is nothing more than a glorified sparring match to him. He's not going in there trying to actually hurt the army guy. Hopefully the army guy's not going on to hurt him. He's just going out there to put on a show. Exactly. Pool, on the other hand, remember, just gave up his dream for a national title in He's boxing. He's trying to make so a name for himself. War, and now the world heavyweight champion is there and he gets to box him. So in the back of his mind, there's got to be a part of him that's just like, I mean... Maybe I could take this guy. So mm. Poole goes in there obviously wanting a real fight. And that's exactly what he got. The match starts. Joe Lewis goes in there. He's dancing around. He's pulling his punches. He's putting on a show. He's being super nice to Poole. Wow, is this actual footage of it? How did they record? If, if this is real, how did they record this? Did they have video back then? I'm genuinely asking. And then the first chance Poole got, he threw a hard punch and just cracked Joe Lewis. Allegedly stumbled him a little bit. And then Joe Lewis tied up with Poole and whispered in his ear, I'm going to teach you a big lesson. The Here ref then broke him apart and Joe Lewis proceeded to beat the shit out of Poole in front of the entire regiment. Poole is later quoted as saying that he was turned any which way but loose by the Brown Bomber. Now the silver lining is that Poole somehow managed to not get knocked out, which is an achievement in it itself is. going it up is. against Joe Lewis. And just so we're clear, if you're not familiar with combat sports, Joe Lewis is absolutely not being a dick right now. This is 100% expected. This is how everybody acts in that situation. And Lafayette Poole knew that's how this would go down the Absolutely. minute he decided to crack him if anything i'm sure lafayette was happy you know that, that that joe didn't hold back on him i'm sure he would rather have had just go at me you know don't don't treat me like a kid because he had like 40 plus boxing matches he knew what he was getting into he got mm. exactly what he was looking for and it's absolutely hilarious and in war daddy's defense it is actually way cooler to say i got in a legitimate fight with joe lewis and uh -huh. survived even though i got my ass beat than it is to say i had a glorified sparring match with exactly. joe lewis one time exactly. and pretty much everybody else agrees and this serves to grow pool's reputation even more fast forward two months june 23rd 1944 war daddy and his crew would arrive at the beaches of Normandy two weeks after D-Day. For the next five days, they would make their way to the front lines following the trail of destruction left by the Allied forces before them. And on the sixth day, June 29th, 1944, they would go out on their first mission, attempting to drive the enemy further back. Using a combination of tanks and infantry, they would drive off the main road through crop fields and they would cut through the different fields and each field was divided by this thin row of trees and bushes that was called a hedgerow. As they go through field after field and have the tanks drive through hedgerow after hedgerow, making a path for the infantry, they would come through another hedgerow where seemingly nothing was any different as they continued to advance through the field as soon as they reached the midway point the something's two coming of the hedgerow they were in up ahead of them would open fire they had oh, walked directly into a german anti-tank unit's ambush as they began taking fire from anti-tank guns machine guns and panzerfausts or tank punchers which were an early German rocket launcher designed to take out Allied tanks. The Germans were so well camouflaged in the hedgerows ahead that they couldn't even be seen. The only thing they could fire at was the muzzle flashes of the Germans firing at them first. As the Americans began to return fire, In the Mood was struck by a Panzerfaust, but it was deflected off of its armor wow. because they were too far away when they fired it. And then I a see. second, and then a third, and then a fourth. In Dang. the Mood had been hit with four tank fists and survived all of them. The American tanks, including In the Mood, attempted to drive forward to push through the ambush, but as they closed the distance between them and the German anti-tank unit, they came into the effective range of the tank punchers. In the Mood and 17 other M4s would be hit and knocked out. As Poole um. ordered his crew to bail out, he would come to the realization that his bow gunner and assistant driver, Arthur Reed, had been killed in action oh. on impact. With so many tanks knocked out, the entire unit was forced to retreat, and in a matter of minutes, Poole's entire battalion had lost 25% of its men, 177 soldiers. Fuck now, man. This was all in the movie, but cause I've, I, I, it's been years since I've watched it, so the kind of plot is gone, but man, this story. And 18 tanks. So Poole's unit falls back to the rear and they begin consolidating, figuring out how many people died, how many tanks they lost, refitting, getting reinforcements, getting everything done. And Poole receives word that his tank, while it was knocked out, is salvageable and it's gonna be mm. up and running in a couple of weeks. At this point, most tank crews would be like, cool, I'll take a couple of weeks off, off hanging out back here, not getting ambushed. But War Daddy and his crew were absolutely furious that their friend was just killed and they want to get back in the fight now, not in two weeks. So Poole demands a new tank and his chain of command, seeing that their golden boy wanted a new tank, turns and says, here you go. And they give him their very first version of the new Sherman M4, the M4A176W nice. with an even bigger gun that's more capable of going toe to toe with German tanks. They're 
upgrade. Then immediately given a replacement bow gunner and assistant driver by the name oh, of Bert Close, a him, 19 year old kid that looks like he just got out of a high school classroom. And for that reason, he is immediately given the nickname Schoolboy as they paint In the Mood 2 down the side of their new tank and go back into the fight. Poole said he learned more in that first three minutes of combat than he did in the three years of training prior to that. He took note of how the Germans put their main anti-tank guns in the corners of the hedgerows to triangulate fire at the middle of the field, and they waited mm -hmm. until they got into the middle of the field before the opening fire so they couldn't retreat back into the hedgerows easily. Mm -hmm. For that reason, every time they cut through a hedgerow, they would immediately use the main gun and fire on each corner, corner. ahead of them, and then yeah. rake everything in between with machine smart. gun fire, that attempting to ambush the enemy first. And this this extremely slow, painstaking form of get them before they get you combat went on for the first month just field after field ambush after ambush fight after fight it took them a month to go five miles further into enemy territory and this wow. wasn't just pool's unit this was the entire military fighting tooth and nail for every inch of land that they got because of this general omar bradley decided to launch operation cobra on july 25th the plan was to bomb the enemy first and then bomb the enemy again and again, and again, and then roll in with tanks and take care of whatever's left. On July 26, 1944, Operation Cobra will reach its apex when 3,300 Allied bombers dropped 14,000 tons of bombs Damn. in the span of three hours. Just for the record, so we're all clear, 14,000 tons is over 30 million pounds in three hours. With all the bombings breaking down- Mate, obviously those bombs were not targeted. It was basically kind of, almost like a carpet bombing sort of uh, technique. But can you, like, even still, that amount of, of dynamite and, and, and explosive material, that is going to cause a load of damage, like huge. Down the enemy line, the combat pace really picked up as In the Mood started traveling miles a day instead of miles a month. During that time, In the Mood 2 would come toe-to-toe -to -toe with its first German Panther tank, and it would take it out in a single shot with its new and improved 76 millimeter cannon. From that moment on, War Daddy, his crew, and In the Mood 2 led point on pretty much every single mission his unit ran, and he was driving the enemy back as fast as humanly possible. In the following days, it became pretty apparent to pretty much everybody that War Daddy and In the Mood 2 were in fact the main characters of this story as he began sitting up higher and higher in his commander's position on the tank pretty soon the other tankers began to describe it as he was sitting so high up on the tank that it looked like he was riding it like a bull showing off his <laughs> cowboy boots over the next several weeks they put so many miles on in the mood 2 and drove through so many hedgerows that they wore out the engine and it needed to be replaced and wow. at this point pool being who he is is like i'm not waiting for that thing to get fixed give just give me tank. another tank so i can keep fighting and the chain of command is like actually that's perfect because now you're original tank is fixed so you can just have that one back <laughs> no god why would they want the original tank back considering they've just had an upgraded one for like a month or two you know what what sense does that make especially considering they're a really good crew Pool immediately is like, no, absolutely not. It's older, it's slower, the yeah. gun is smaller, and most importantly, my friend died in the assistant driver's seat, and I don't want to look at that for the rest of this war. I'm not taking that tank. He was then given a direct order to take the tank, to which what? he's like, okay, fine. He then orders the rest of his crew to go over to In the Mood 2 and observe it getting fixed by the mechanics and having a new motor put in it, which is weird because they're not getting that tank back anyways, so why on earth is he doing that? In reality, he just wanted to make sure that his crew was somewhere so they couldn't get blamed with what he's about uh, to do. So he goes over by himself, picks up his new tank, the... and then proceeds to immediately drive it directly into a lake. I mean, technically, we don't know that for <laughs> sure. The only official documentation as to what happened to this tank uh... is from the maintenance crew, and it says, and I quote, Quote, the vehicle was believed to have been driven into a lake. <laughs> Sabotage, and at this point, the chain of command is just like, I, okay, well, I mean, let's hold on. This is the golden boy. I don't, I don't want to get rid of him. Hear me out. He did just save a tank the other day that we were going to lose. Exactly. He ran in front of a bunch of machine gun fire and got that tank back. So now that he threw this tank away, it's basically a net zero. I think we should just let it slide. Go ahead. Give him a new M4A176W again. And we'll get him back on the front lines. And that's it. That's the whole story. They give him a new tank and he goes back to fighting. Okay. Do you understand how incredibly gangster that is? This is an entire another level of plot armor. Okay. Going yeah. toe to toe with the enemy and like doing some crazy stuff and surviving. That's one level. Going toe to toe with Uncle Sam about his money is a completely another mm. level of plot armor that most people can't even fathom. For example, when you go to get out of the military, they make you turn in every piece of equipment they ever gave you ever. Okay. They're going to pull out a sheet of paper that's this long 
long with a list of all of it. And it's going to be the most ridiculous stuff on the planet. They're going to be like, yeah, we gave you a, uh, a marker tube type in 2003. What the fuck is a marker tube type? Oh, a sh wow. They make you do that. They don't let you keep anything, nothing. I mean, they must let you keep some small things like stuff, forgettable things like stationary, things like that. Sharpie. You gave me a Sharpie in 2003? No okay, I'll just pay Sharpies for it. Back. How much does the government pay for Sharpies? Um, $79.95 is what we pay for fucking Sharpies around here. And then you have to pay the government $79.95 for a Sharpie that you lost what? 20 years ago. Otherwise, they negatively impact your credit score. The rest of us mere mortals are over here getting harassed by the U.S. military wow. because we lost a canteen cup at some point. Meanwhile, War Daddy's over here waterboarding an entire tank and just walking away like like nothing happened and nobody cares. This yep. is an unprecedented level of plot armor. So yep. that's August 16th. He gets his new tank in the mood three. August 17th, the very next day, they come into a humongous battle. They catch up with an entire German armored unit that has 12 Panther tanks. Luckily, the allied forces at this point in time have air superiority. So they radio in for some planes and they come in and they bomb the entire Panther unit. Then after the planes drop a bunch of bombs all over them, then all of the American Sherman tanks start to advance. And then a couple minutes later, another group of American planes come. They were either P-38s or P-47s, depending on which source you want to read. Doesn't really matter. Either way, American planes come, and then they proceeded to bomb everybody, the American tanks included. And during this bombing run, In the Mood 3 and the tank next to it would both be hit. Luckily, nobody in War Daddy's crew would be hurt. However, both of the tanks were knocked out. At which point, the battalion commander orders everybody to fall back because things have just went catastrophically wrong. Poole orders his men to all bail out and run back. Baby the driver and Jailbird the loader both cool, dope. They hop out of the tank. They run back. It is now Poole and Schoolboy left inside this tank. The other tank right next to In the Mood 3 also bails out and they all run off. However, one of those crew members is hurt and they're laying on the oh, ground. No. War Daddy sees this, hops out of his tank, runs over to try to save this guy, drawing all of the machine gun fire from the German side on In the Mood 3. War Daddy ends up making it over to this other tanker and helping to save him. However, Burt Close, schoolboy, is now pinned down underneath In the Mood 3. So he just digs oh, in no. and buries himself underneath the tank, hoping that he's not hit Nobody by enemy machine gun him. fire yeah. or an American plane. So that's all he does. Okay. He just lays underneath the tank and kind of buries himself in the dirt and he waits and he waits, listening to the machine gun fire bounce off his tank as he hears American bombs exploding in the background and he just waits. And 10 minutes go by and suddenly somebody runs and dives under the tank and it scares the shit out of Burt Close. And he looks over, it's an American, so he kind of relaxes for a second, but that dude doesn't see Burt yet. And Burt Close, schoolboy, recognizes this guy. It was his friend from basic training that he hadn't no seen in like way. two years. And Close remembers on the first day of basic training, this guy got- That 10 minutes would have been probably the most terrifying 10 minutes of his life for sure. I'm sure he's probably been through some- horrific things so far on in this war but man he must have been thinking i'm gonna die i'm gonna die i'm gonna die got asked a question by the drill instructor and he told the drill instructor i don't know and from that point on throughout the rest of their training that particular drill instructor would always tell this guy what do you know? Bearing that in mind, Schoolboy asks the guy, hey, what the hell happened? And that guy responds, I have no idea. To which Schoolboy responds the same thing the drill instructor would have responded, what do you know? And that guy whipped his head around, recognizing the voice of his friend, and they were reunited after like two years not seeing each other, not knowing if they were alive. They've just ran into each other in the most unfortunate the circumstance on the what planet, the and then they just hung out for the next hour in the middle of this firefight, catching up, because there's literally nothing else they could do, and it's the most army thing I've ever heard, yep. ever. So while Close is catching up with his buddy, War Daddy makes his way back to safety, he carries that injured tanker with him, and then he realizes that he's missing Burt Close schoolboy and he was not about to lose another assistant driver and bow gunner and he is ready to run back into hell to go get him too. He is then physically restrained and given a direct order to not. So like an hour goes by, Schoolboy and his buddy are just chilling underneath the remnants of In the Mood 3, waiting for the bombs to clear up. Finally, the German armor unit's forced to retreat. They get the all clear. The planes aren't going to be coming anymore. And then they just kind of get out from underneath the tank. And but how many tanks did the, the, the US military go through in World War II? I mean, just judging from the rate of which they're getting destroyed in this video, we must be talking hundreds, right? Hundreds of tanks, more walk back and everything's okay. So now the next problem is it in the mood three is gone. They no longer have a tank. Well, 
By that time, they had already replaced the motor and in the mood too, and they were ready to hop back in that. So the next day, August 18th through August 26th, War Daddy and the crew of In the Mood 2 go ham. They spearhead every single mission, driving further and further into enemy territory, wrecking absolutely anybody that gets in their way. Pool and In the Mood 3 are leading the entire 3rd Armored Division deeper and deeper in enemy territory, and during this point of the war, the 3rd Armored Division earns the nickname the Spearhead Division because they are leading the rest of the military military into the fight because they are advancing so rapidly. It is literally the largest unhealth care system in the world being spearheaded by War Daddy and his crew of In the Mood 2. They are pushing so hard so- Did he just say unhealth care system? <laughs> So fast in enemy territory that they start getting direct orders from the battalion commander to slow down and let everybody else catch up. There's accounts of In the Mood 2 taking out entire infantry companies by themselves, 250 men in a single day. And somehow, presumably divine plot armor, despite the fact that they are the first and sometimes the only one into a fight, they go completely untouched every single time. How then, though? August 27th, they come across a major set of train tracks, at which point they're all like, I got an idea. Let's line the tanks up and wait. And that's what they did. And they waited and they waited. And like eight hours later, here comes a German train full of all types of cargo and equipment and tanks and armored vehicles rolling down the tracks. And a bunch of Sherman tanks just opened fire, turning the entire thing into a shooting gallery, destroying absolutely everything on this train. At which point, Pool is like, cool. Now that I know which direction the trains are headed, I'm going to go get the next one. Yep. It takes off heading the opposite direction that the train... But couldn't they have taken some of that cargo, some of the food? I mean, it could it would have been useful for the, for the troops, the American troops and the Allies. It's going to be coming, so he's going to catch this train before anybody else. And sure enough, like an hour later, here comes another train headed in the exact same direction. It is now in the mood too, and this train going head to head as in the mood too starts firing 76 millimeter rounds into the engine of the locomotive. After two shots, it completely destroys the locomotive engine as the rest of the train glides to a halt. As they pull around and the rest of the train comes into view, there are four German Tiger II tanks on this train. They haven't even ran into one of these in combat yet, and there's four wow, of them sitting new. dead on this train, but the Germans are running to get in the tanks to use them as artillery and get the guns aimed at In the Mood 2, and one of those German guns will absolutely destroy In the Mood 2 probably with a single hit. At this point, Schoolboy starts using his 30 cal machine gun and War Daddy starts using the 50 cal up top to shoot at these German Tiger tanks, not because it's actually gonna hurt the tanks, but because all the machine gun fire is keeping the Germans from getting inside of them to be able to use them. And while that's Slowing going, Groundhog is opening fire on the tanks with the 76 millimeter over and over, finally being able to break through the Tiger tanks armor, destroying all four of the tanks as they continue to destroy everything else on this train. For the next half hour, it is a complete shoot shooting gallery is in the mood to wreaks havoc on this now defenseless train. At some point, the rest of the tanks catch up and they chip in too, but the majority of the credit ends up going to in the mood too. When the smoke clears, they make sure all the Germans are gone, and then they go in and see what else, if there's any cargo that's salvageable, hoping for like, I don't know, German chocolate, or food, mm. or most importantly, booze. And they go in and they- Probably cigarettes as well, because they used to smoke a lot back in those days. Start looking at all the cargo, and it's an entire train, besides the tanks and a couple armored cars that were on there. All the cargo is just like, French lingerie and fancy what? perfumes and a bunch of woman stuff. Basically, they huh? figured the Germans were just loading up trains full of anything they could find of value inside of France and trying to ship it back by rail uh... to Germany to extract as much value as possible as they were being forced to retreat. Now, here's the silver lining. Somebody had the brilliant idea of like, hey, it's not food and it's not beer, but hear me out. The entire third AD is on its way to Belgium right now. And if we show up in Belgium and we give all the ladies there a bunch of French lingerie and perfume, <laughs> we're gonna be heroes and then maybe, just maybe, they'll wear it for us. If so facto, there's now an entire regiment of M4 Sherman tanks and armored cars full to the brim of fancy French lingerie and perfume headed to Belgium. Now at this point, while everybody else is loading up lingerie and perfume, the chain of command is having a meeting because War Daddy and his tank crew just took out an entire train pretty much by themselves, including four German Tiger II tanks. So we need to get them some kind of award. So it, it becomes clear to the chain of command that these are probably the best tank crew that America has right now. And they would do it better job of serving the country if they were sent back home 
and sent on tour where they could tell their story and help sell war bonds. And honestly, they've earned it at this point. So the chain of command then orders Pool to fall all the way back to the very rear and let everybody else handle everything from here. But he's not going to want to do that, is he? He's not going to want to do that. We're on out. Fast forward two hours later, <laughs> whoever's spearheading the formation now comes up to this bridge. And this bridge is the only way across this river and it's being guarded by three German Panthers and leadership has no idea how to cross this bridge. So leadership has another meeting and they're like, fuck, I guess let's fuck get War Daddy back up here. We need the main character. Bring him up. So all tanks. War Daddy. Looks like I'm in. Pool gets the order. He pulls out of the formation, drives to the very front again. He's been gone for a whole two hours. He gets to the front, gets briefed on what's going on. He evaluates the situation. He looks off in the distance. There's this big hill on their side of the river. So he's like, okay, you guys stay here. I'm going to go handle this. So they go, they drive up to the top of this hill. He now has a good view of the rest of the river and he can actually make out one of the German Panther tanks. He can't see the other two. He doesn't know how many are there. He just knows they're there. They're so well camouflaged, but he can see one of them. So he takes aim and he gets them ready. And he's like, we're going to, we're just going to rapid fire this entire thing. He opens fire. And as soon as he fires, there's another round in by jailbird and they fire again wow. and again and again and they take out this first panther tank and they do it so fast and they fire so many times that all the other tanks think that they're getting ambushed and they start retreating oh, there was only no. two tanks there he sees them once they start moving but those tanks take off thinking that there's way more tanks than just one attacking them because of, because of the rate of fire <laughs> While Poole's entire unit's kind of just sitting there, like listening, hearing tank fire in the background, wondering what's happening. A few minutes later, Poole comes driving by again and just drives right across the bridge. So everybody else is like, okay. And then they follow him and then problem solved. War Daddy saved the day yet again. At this point, Poole's probably thinking to himself like, okay, this is the point where I'm supposed to stop, get orders. They're probably going to send me to the back of the formation again. And he's like, but I don't want that because off in the distance, a couple miles ahead, he sees a German town and he knows that that town is probably full of all types of important German supplies because a second ago they had three German Panther tanks trained mm -hmm. on a single choke point. It was a pretty safe place to be. And he knows that if he can get there in a hurry, he can probably take out a bunch of more enemy objectives. So he just hauls ass straight into this town right down Main Street. And sure enough, there's four German ammo trucks full of German war supplies. And he takes out all four of them by himself as the rest of the unit is desperately trying to keep up. After a while, so- but how though, how is he so good compared to the other ones? I know that there are people who just are naturals at things. Perhaps that's what he is and his crew, but it just seems like the gap between him and his crew and the, and the other crews is just so big. Some of the other tanks finally catch up to Poole, but Poole keeps leading them deeper and further into enemy-held territory. And at dusk that night, they'd be ambushed by more Panther tanks. And that ambush started by one of the Panther tanks shooting directly at In the Mood 2. Luckily, it was a glancing blow and everybody was okay. In the Mood turns, returns fire, and scores a direct hit, knocking out the tank as the German crew bails out. But the tank didn't burst into flames yet, and that's not acceptable. So, In the Mood 2 advances to shoot this tank again. <laughs> as they hit it again, the whole thing blows up as <laughs> in the mood two gets hit again from another panther tank oh, and again it glances off the armor and everybody's okay but they don't know where the hell it came from because it's so dark out they can't actually see anything so now they're just waiting and they're waiting and they're kind of moving back and forth and this panther tank fires at him again and they could see the muzzle flash the panther oh, missed and in the mood starts returning fire just in that general direction firing blindly and after four or five rounds sent that way they see an enormous explosion and flames as they had scored Nailed a direct it. hit on the enemy panther tank with pure luck any remaining german forces are forced to flee and that was the end of that battle they bed down for the night they get some more gas in the tank they get everything fixed they eat some food and the next morning they take off again driving further into enemy Enemy held territory. The next morning, War Daddy and In the Mood 2 take off hauling ass with the rest of the tanks. Poole figures that those two German Panthers ambushed them because they were trying to protect something and he wants to find out what it was. So he keeps charging deeper and deeper in enemy held territory, and that's when he comes across an entire German supply convoy. Oh. And yet again, War Daddy and In the Mood proceed. Jackpot to turn this entire supply caravan into a shooting gallery. In the Mood alone is credited with destroying over a hundred vehicles, two German Panther tanks, two other tanks, three German 88 anti-tank guns, claiming over 50 enemies KIA, claiming 63 as prisoners of war, and a ton of others wounded. When the smoke settles from this and the leadership gets to figure out what actually happened, it is decided that the In the Mood crew is all going to receive bronze stars and Lafayette Green Pool is going to receive the 
Distinguished Service Cross. He would also be nominated for the Medal of Honor, but that was rejected for some reason. Something to do with uh, being in a tank is a team effort, and he didn't do it by himself, so he doesn't what? deserve the Medal of Honor, which doesn't really make... Are you kidding me? Like, he still had to lead those guys. Oh. <sighs> sometimes rules just don't make any sense sense but it never does so that happened now from here it's pretty smooth sailing they don't have much contact with the german military they're pretty much just going from town to town hanging out in a town at the end of every night however in the mood continues to be the number one spearhead of the entire division and now instead of being the first into contact they're the first into every town and that comes with its own unique set of rewards because as soon as american tanks start rolling in all the people come running out as they start celebrating that the americans are here to beat the nazis and they start showering them with gifts cheeses bread fruits eggs and most importantly booze so in in the mood gets first dibs on all the booze this pattern repeats itself day after day for a little while and then they eventually come up on a bigger city called Leger in Belgium once there they take the city pretty easily capturing 1500 German POWs and then they've essentially freed the town at which point all the townspeople come rushing out to thank the Americans and surprise surprise this city is full of very attractive young Belgium women they start giving the soldiers Hello. gifts like food and booze and in exchange Hello. the soldiers break out the fancy lingerie and perfume that they liberated from that train a couple of days ago and they start giving that back in exchange and the entire thing turns into one gigantic block party that kind of ends up turning into a shit show because all the soldiers spread out as they start sleeping with all these young women showing them that inches are in fact better than centimeters and everybody is just completely hammered which was fine there was nothing wrong with that right up until the next morning when the chain of Nah, man, the metric system all the way, all the way. Command got the order to move out immediately. At which point the leadership, A, they're hungover, but B, they're kind of looking around and it's just like there's passed out people drunk all over the city, on the sidewalks, in the streets. It's chaos. The soldiers are all spread out because they all went home with different women. They don't know where like 75% of their soldiers even are. They radio back. They're like, we're going to... We're going to need a couple of days to regroup. We had an issue in town here. So after that, they spend the next couple of days regrouping and getting ready to move out again. After they get regrouped, it's off to the Siegfried line, the border of Germany, guarded by dragon's teeth, mines, machine gun wow. positions, and barbed wire. They have to find... So heavily fortified make their last push and break into Germany. On their way to the Siegfried line, Poole is informed that him and his crew are not going to be allowed to spearhead this mission either, and they are to remain in the rear because him and his crew are still going to get sent home early so that they can sell war bonds and be heroes. Poole is also informed that they are going to be taking away his loader. Del Boggs, Jailbird, is going to be sent all the way to the rear where he is going to have to undergo a vision and hearing exam for the next two weeks, pretty much the entire duration of the rest of their time in theater before they get sent back home. And the actual reason for this was because his brother had passed away in combat two weeks oh. prior and he was the last remaining son in his family and the commander did not want to have to tell oh. that man's family that he died in combat two weeks before he was supposed to come home so he was going to be sent all the way to the rear where he was going to stay until he could get sent back to america bearing all this in mind pool agrees and he to be honest as much as it would suck for him at the time i think honestly like for the sake of his family that was a nice thing to do he is going to remain in the rear of the formation and he's not going to be doing anything crazy. He is then assigned a brand new, fresh out of basic training, private first class Kenneth King to be the replacement loader for Jailbird, the best M4 loader in all of World War II. Somehow a German tank snuck past the American line and managed to ambush Poole's section and the first tank they managed to shoot was in the mood. Poole immediately oh, orders his crew to return gosh. fire, which they do, but the shell wasn't effective against the Panther, as he orders them to fire again, but Private First Class Kenneth King wasn't able to reload at the same pace that Jailbird was before him. So Poole orders no Baby chance. to throw it in reverse as he tries to get this kid more time to reload the gun. He ends up jamming the gun as the Panther fires another uh. shell at In the Mood, and it punches through In the Mood and hits Private First Class Kenneth King directly in the head, killing oh. him instantly. As Poole and Groundhog are both ejected from the tank severely wounded oh. and the tank is still being thrown in reverse being manned by nobody except for baby and schoolboy driving blind they just continue to travel in reverse as another panther shell hits in the mood but glances off after about 30 yards they end up hitting a ditch and rolling the entire tank while that's going on pool who'd been ejected from the tank moments earlier looks down to see that one of his legs has been completely shredded by the uh. shrapnel as he reaches into his pocket pulls out a morphine serrette basically a single one-time use dose of morphine injects 
checks himself before pulling out his pocket knife and attempting to remove what's left of his leg. The nearby American tanks engage the German Panther, destroying it as a neighboring tank commander runs to Poole's aid. As Poole is yelling at him to go help the people in the tank, he doesn't. Wow. He runs up to Poole, injects him with another morphine syrette before calling medics to aid him. When the medics show up, they inject him with yet another morphine syrette. And Dang, how is he not OD'd? Poole loses consciousness. The rest of the In the Mood crew survives and they end up ultimately getting reassigned to different tank crews where they remain for the rest of World War II. Poole, on the other hand, has to have his right leg amputated eight inches above the knee and he is sent back home where he spends the next 22 months in the hospital battling different infections, rehabbing and getting fitted for a prosthetic. By the time he's released from the hospital, it is 1946 and World War II is over and he is then immediately discharged from the United States military because he now no longer has a leg. Lafayette Greenpool, AKA War Daddy, and his tank crew of In The Mood were in combat together for 81 days in World War II. And in that 81 days, they are credited with taking out 1,000 German soldiers, capturing 250 more, wow. destroying 275 armored vehicles, and 12 German tanks. For this, Holy Poole had been nominated shit. for the Medal of Honor twice. The first time the paperwork had apparently been lost and the second time he was just flat out rejected. He was, however, awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Legion of Merit, a Purple Heart, the French Croix de Guerre, and the Belgian Fourier. After being released from the military, he went back home to Texas where him and his wife started having kids and he worked as a mechanic at a gas station for a number of years. And then, after a few years, the United States military came out with a special program where they would let people rejoin the military if they had special or desired talents regardless of their physical disabilities and mm. Poole fit that bill. He was brought back into the military to serve as an advisor and to help train the next generation of tankers. He I would mean, do they should have done that from the start. Are you kidding me? You, you've got this guy who's clearly the best tanker there is. Why wouldn't you have him in as a consultant as soon as he's retired? Like, as soon as he's literally awake. That from 1948 until retiring in 1960 as a warrant officer for. He then decides that his next life adventure is going to be to be a preacher, which he does for a number of years, which honestly makes sense because the dude is super good at putting people in touch with God. So he does that for a little <laughs> while and then he gets bored with that and he decides that he wants to give back and help the community. So he decides that he's going to be a teacher. He goes and he becomes a middle school shop teacher. And on the first day of any kid's shop class, he would always lecture them on the importance of safety and how dangerous power tools could be right before drilling a hole directly into his wooden prosthetic leg. But the kid Kids didn't know that at the time. After that, he finally does truly retire. And in his retirement, he forms a relationship with the armored units out of Fort Hood. They bring him out there. They let him drive in an M1 Abrams tank for the first time. He's blown away at how much better they are than the tanks that he drove during World War II. They also have him as the guest of honor at all their military events where he commonly gets to speak and he gets to know all the guys and then in 1990 they're sent off to fight in desert storm if you don't know desert storm is considered to be the last great tank battles the world has ever seen the last time that tanks were going toe to toe with one another on the battlefield and the entire time that his guys were out there lafayette pool was back home glued to the news, watching it every single moment of every single day. And as Desert Storm and by extension, tank versus tank warfare would come to a close, so would Lafayette Poole. His health began to decline and he would pass away at the age of 71 on May 30th, 1991, the very same day that he received word that his armored unit out of Fort Hood had made their way to Germany safely on their way back home to America wow. because Desert Storm was over. Bringing a close not only to tank warfare as the world knew it, but the life of one of the greatest men to ever do it. So wow. in conclusion, wow. if this has taught us anything, chills, man, never underestimate what you can accomplish by cheating on your next eye exam. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go by some merch. Unbelievable story, man. Wow. Lafayette Paul, what a guy, what a man. It's just for me, a travesty. He didn't get the medal of honor. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, you know, you can call it a team effort, but Give them all the Medal of Honor then. If they were so clearly the best tanking unit in the US military at the time, recognize that. Because not only do you recognize their efforts, you're incentivizing the other tank crews by showing them that it's possible for them to also get awarded the Medal of Honor should they display, you know, amazing ability, heroism, that kind of stuff. It seems unfair that he wasn't given that, that award. Like, hopefully, you know, posthumously, you know, a president gives it to him, his family, because obviously he's no longer with us. 
but just an incredible effort. Just not just him, but Gerald Bird, Baby, all of the other guys. Just, you know, they they each did their jobs fantastically well, just honed it down to a science. You know, that's obviously a lot of repetition, a lot of practice, but also it is just talent. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.